no industry changes faster than modern marketing. Great marketers need an edge. Great marketers need to be brave. The Brave Marketer podcast provides an opportunity for each guest to share a story where they exhibited bravery by taking a risk that made a dramatic impact in the market. Our guests are marketers from top brands and agencies who share the exact strategies and tactics they used in their brave marketing moment. We then dive deep into topics like ethical advertising, consumer privacy, crypto marketing, brand safety, and navigating a future without third-party cookies. Hosted by Brave Software and me, Donnie DeVoren, head of sales at Brave. Together, we'll get a backstage view of the brave marketing moments and creative mindset work that's shaping today's most influential brands. You're listening to a new episode of the Brave Marketer podcast. I think you're going to really enjoy this one. We like to end the season with somebody internal and talking about Brave and what's going on. In this one, we're going to really focus on NFTs. We're going to have Luke Molks. He's the VP of Business Operations at Brave and Bat. And prior to Brave, Luke was the Director of Ad Ops at OAO and has an extensive background in startups and in publishing. And he's been working very hard with the Brave community on launching exciting partnerships at Brave. So you'll think you'll enjoy his insight. But before we hop into today's episode, we want to highlight our Brave Pick of the Week. In every episode, we choose a brand that has run an ad campaign with Brave. And this week, we're choosing Axion. And they're a revolutionary staking platform. And users can now use Bat to stake Axion. So check that out. And they ran a sponsored image with us and our push notifications. And the impact was that they had 63 million impressions with the sponsored images and an 18.6% CTR on their push campaigns. Look out for that case study, and that'll be live on Brave.com very soon. So with no further ado, here is our episode with Luke Mulks. Luke, welcome to the Brave Marketer Podcast. We are so excited for you. As I was mentioning in the intro, this is a special episode for us. We're thrilled to have Luke Mulks, and he's going to talk a lot about crypto and NFT and all things Brave, and it's a great way to end the season. So Luke, how are you doing today? Doing well. Thanks for having me on, Donnie. Yeah, appreciate it. What's the most exciting thing you're working on right now, Luke? Oh, gosh. I think we have a couple of things that are pretty exciting right now. We're all working on kind of this Brave wallet upgrade that's going to be available for desktop and mobile. It'll really on-ramp a lot of people to crypto. And then we're working on the advertising side, too. We just introduced uh, Brave News a week or so ago, and it's been exciting to watch that go out to the masses. Great. So you know that this podcast is called The Brave Marketer because everybody has a story in their career where they took a bit of a risk and they were brave. Do you have a brave marketing moment that you can share with the audience? Sure. Yeah, this one's kind of tough because there are a few of them. But I think that even just going back, like I started working with Brave back in March of 2016, and I was in advertising as a director of ad products there. And I saw what Brave was doing, and they were the first to kind of like really try and tackle like privacy from the root and also allow for business to be business and operate on a web. And no one else was really doing that. And I've done a bunch of startups in the past and seen them crash and burn. And I always told myself that to go back to the startup environment would require having kind of a team of people that were as nutty as I am that were all committed. And that's what I saw at Brave. So, you know, I'd say like my Brave marketing moment was one, launching off and joining this team early. And then the other thing would be around kind of what we did around the token sale for BAT, which is you're kind of marketing what this future could be back in 2017. And you have a white paper and we had a product and Brennan was out there basically doing every interview he could do and doing all these AMAs and lots of things to tell people the vision for this. And you're really selling the vision. The fact that so many people just were rushing to be a part of that when we did the token sale was all that kind of lumped together. They're both like really high risk things, a good gig in, in advertising to come join this thing that's working very much against the grain. And then also like just how new the token sales and the tokenomics and the token economy was at the time in 2017. Those, I give you two there. <laughs> yeah. No, that's totally good. And as you should, you saw an amazing opportunity early on. You took a risk when there was a very small team and your ability to work on the bat white paper and really 
be at the genesis of our entire ads product, which is now three products. And back then it was just an idea of dudes to do push notifications. And now we have push notifications and sponsored images on the new tab and brave news ads, which is like our new native ad unit. And you coming up with the ideas from the start and being there all along is really amazing. So now I want to switch gears a little bit. It seems like everybody and their mother literally are talking about NFTs. And maybe we should start with just talking about NFTs are if you want to describe it. And I'm part of a couple different crypto chains. And I have a friend and he's talking about he's a musician and he can create a piece of music. He could make it an NFT and then make himself the owner. And then let's say it gets used by somebody on YouTube. The money made from the video could get rerouted to back to him to pay royalties. And then he could sell the piece of music but maintain 50% of the publishing rights and get a 25% commission on the resale. So like, that's just an extreme example of what's happening with the NFTs. But why don't we take a step back and why don't, in your own words, explain what an NFT is? Yeah, so like when you're looking at crypto, most people are familiar with fungible tokens like Bitcoin or BAT or Ethereum, where one BAT is one BAT and, and you can swap a BAT with me and everybody's happy. And the idea with non-fungible tokens is you're creating a, a token for that's representative of something that is unique in a single issued item. So I have a Mona Lisa painting or I make a run of Mona Lisa paintings and they're represented by these individual tokens on the blockchain. It's almost like having a set of tickets for a movie theater and then having an arcade with interchangeable tokens as non-fungible tokens in the background. So the cool thing around this is a lot of the focus has been around the art side of it. People talking about buying JPEGs or Christie's having auction house for these large NFT, big ticket NFT items etc. There's a lot of other things that you can do, just like in the example that you gave around rights management. I think the cool thing about crypto in general is it's very empowering and it's putting the power back in the hands of the creators. And with NFTs, you can program in rights management and they have these different protocols around basically, you know, as long as this is sold, I'm going to get a credit back for it, a percentage of it back. And it puts the power back into the hands of the artist. And it also disintermediates as the creator economy builds up and people are much closer closer to their followings than they used to be. It gives the creators that ability to basically have more control over their art and to auction it out or use these new models um, and new distribution models in new ways that haven't been done before. So it's a more fair representation of things, but it's also something that's unique to a user. If I go and buy that record, it's my record and I can go sell it again if I want. I can hold it there, but it's mine. It's, it's not something that's like on Spotify, it's going to be stream and gone. This is something that can be tied to something in real life. Like it could be tied to a vinyl record that could also be attached to the NFT. There's a lot of uses cases for these things and we're just scratching the surface of it right now. Yeah, I think the key word is unique, that the token is unique and it's just for one person. The first time I saw NFTs was actually for sneakers and it was people that were collecting sneakers, but didn't want the sneakers shipped to, to their home because they, they may have been living in a small apartment and didn't want and didn't have room for a hundred pairs of Air Jordans in their apartment. And so they could actually own a token an NFT that represented those sneakers and it was unique for those sneakers and unique to them. That was my first. It's an authenticity, right? Like you're proving that what you have is authentic and you can verify that on a public blockchain. That's, that's pretty much as good as it gets as far as like making sure that jersey that you're going to buy or those sneakers that you're going to buy are actually what they are claiming to be, you know, from the seller. Right. And so now you see literally hundreds of thousands of NFTs for sale in these markets. Can you give an overview of who are the main players in the markets and why are people spending anywhere from $10 to hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars on what looks like to our moms is JPEGs or digital art. Yeah, right now you've got a lot of big marketplace players that were around early on that have really grown like the open seas of the world where marketplace where you can go and buy these things. A lot of it is around giving artists the ability to earn some interesting money, but it's all been around this crypto audience that is pretty crypto rich. And you have these collector types where, you know, oh, I could have number 155 of CryptoPunks, right? Like where I could have 
have this one of a kind thing and people turning those into their avatars on Twitter. And so you get this early on, it's like a lot of this kind of collector mindset around it. And a lot of people that are very much on the tech side of things that would be collectors. And just like with anything else, you have some people that are in art collection because they love a great piece of art. You have some people that are in it because they are buying art that holds value and they could see that to returning greater value over time. So it's kind of a neat way to take, if you're going to be in crypto for a while, it's a neat way to take that crypto and put it into something that is crypto centric that you own and that's yours and represents you so you can get credit in the community. But also it's very much branching into new areas. We worked with a couple of different vendors on this front where things like access control, like the music example is one thing, but also you could do time restricted subscriptions to publications and things like that. Like access control becomes a really interesting use case, especially for us as a browser where you've got people that are going and paying for publications on a monthly cycle. You could say, hey, here's a brave pass where you get an NFT and it gives you access to X, Y, and Z thing. So there's a lot of interesting use cases from a browser. And, and a lot of this is the mainstream folks that are getting into it now are doing it for the art because you have a lot of really interesting artists that are coming on board and doing things. And any multimedia can be put into an NFT as long as it's up to a certain size. You could have video, you can have just this, be like Jack on Twitter, just a JPEG of his first tweet going out and selling for millions of dollars. So it's a new medium that gives you an opportunity to have something unique and ties back to the blockchain. Yeah, yeah, the, it totally makes sense. And let's talk about the investing side of it. And then let's talk about the marketing side of it. So first, the investment. People are obviously buying these NFTs because they think they're going to go up in value. But there's also a supply and demand out there where it feels to the person you know, outside looking in that there's unlimited supply of these NFTs. And so if you have unlimited supply, it's not like, you know, Bitcoin with whatever those 21 million. If, if you have unlimited supply, how can the value increase? Why would somebody buy it, hold on to it and sell it for more? This is something that people, you know, should keep in mind too, is if you buy an NFT from Joe Schmo that is just getting into this thing and you spend a lot of money on it, it might not have been the greatest idea, right? Like it's just like anything else. If it's an artist that is known um, and is doing something unique or special, just like with any other piece of art that you invest in, you're hoping that comes back. And, and there's another variable that's interesting with the crypto markets, because like when the markets are up, everybody's on it. When the markets are down, it's either a long game or a really short game because a lot of times people will buy these things pretty quickly and flip them around or people will hold on to them for a long time like we're seeing now like there are some crypto kitties from the original mint that happened a couple of years ago that are significantly higher in value so it really depends on who the artist is or what the project is that's putting them out and like is there a demand for this nft is the art cool enough that people want it right and, and so these aren't really necessarily new concepts around investing in value and, and things like that but it's a craze, right? You're going to get everybody jumping in on a craze. And it's one to be cautious around <laughs> if you're putting big money into something and hoping for a return. You should want to do it and think of it as a long-term thing around crypto and why like being part of something like this from the early stages. You know, just like an old baseball card has value, right? Like it's a similar principle with NFTs. It's the cream rises to the top and the stuff that is of higher value over time. If you buy that as an NFT, then cool. But I think the other appealing thing is that there's just a lot of other use cases for these things that, that are on the horizon or, or just starting to come out that, that will be interesting, you know? Yeah, I, I think of NFTs as the way I think about stocks, right? What or the Warren Buffett way is, what do I use on a daily basis that I would want to own? Warren Buffett may eat McDonald's and drink Coca-Cola, and that's what he buys as far as stocks go, where you and I may be really into Tesla. And so before we launched Brave Talk, we were using Zoom all the time. And maybe somebody is a big Snapchat user or whatever it is. And those are the stocks that they end up buying. And I think about the same thing with NFTs, where like using my sneaker example, if I'm not really into sneakers, I'm not going to buy that NFT, but people should buy what they're really passionate about. And when it comes to artwork, people should buy from artists that they know and or if they don't know the artist, like a piece of artwork that they would put up in their house, not just saying, oh, I'm just going to buy this random NFT. I don't like the art. I don't know anything about it. I just think it's going to go up in value. 
because that may not work out. Exactly. And, and there can be other like elements of it too. It's like um, my wife and I have a picture frame that has all these different concert ticket stubs that we've gone to over the years and they fade with time. But like it, literally those could all be NFTs and they can have sentimental value too. And that's what's so neat about this. The variety in application, it, it's, it's not even really well known because these things are still new and it's still not the easiest thing to even buy. But once you get past some of these next phases where it becomes fast, easy, and cheap to use NFTs, I think you're gonna see them everywhere. And you're not even gonna necessarily know that they're there. It's like those sensors that you can just, near field sensors where you can tap your phone against it and it'll do something. You don't know what's underneath that sensor, but you know that if you put your phone there, it'll take you to a link or, or whatever. Like people are using email and they're not talking about, okay, the email protocol that's underneath, they're just using the email. I think NFTs are just gonna, it solves a lot of problems, like especially for marketers too. If you think about it and you want to generate a promo that has a certain thousand amount of these NFTs available, you can have an individual NFT. And then like in our situation where we're always concerned about privacy, right? Like you could serve a private ad that is linked to an NFT for the campaign and then not have to go through all of the tracking and privacy issues, but know that what you're getting when somebody uses that NFT is something that's unique and authentic because it's an NFT and it's not just a JPEG from Google that everybody can go pull down. Like it's verifiable. So, so there's a lot of applications for this stuff that are going to be blowing up beyond this whole art craze thing. And that's where I'm most excited around this is, you know, and, and this has been done in blockchain gaming too. We partnered with a couple of big blockchain gaming uh, companies and they're already using NFTs for things like skins and games. So if you want to go buy a blacksmith shop in this game, you can buy an NFT of the land deed and actually own a piece of the game, which is, or, or, or hold a representative piece of the game. It's interesting because in gaming, somebody goes and buys a whole Call of Duty set, then the next game comes out, then they have all that value that's sunk in the last version of the game that they have to spend again with the new thing. With these NFTs, you can actually have something that can go from game to game. So there's a lot of like really interesting applications out there for NFTs. And right now it's in this early stage where People are proving that these things are of interest and you see all this activity like right now today, if I look, you know, all of the transactions on the Ethereum network, I think OpenSea is accounting for something like 20% of all of the network transactions that are happening right now, which is huge when you think about how big Ethereum is. Right now it's in this early stages. Once these things become fast and easy, which I think if you look at what Tezos and, and some of these other blockchains are doing, even Polygon on Ethereum, there's this stuff isn't stuff from for years out. This is stuff that's happening now and it's a competition on top of and around Ethereum to see which one of these takes hold and, and goes forward. But yeah, it's an exciting time for NFTs right now, for sure. Yeah. Have you seen any good marketing use cases of it? Taco Bell did a campaign where I think you could get an NFT for a drive through if you brought in the promo code or something like that. I think that there are going to be a lot of interesting cases with ticketing and live events. I went to conferences. There's a, it's, I think it's a, a POAP. It's like a POAP token and you can actually get proof of attendance uh, protocol. So you can go to an event, you prove that you are the event and then there's like a record of you being at the event, right? So there's all sorts of interesting marketing hooks that are available now, but also some interesting stuff coming on the horizon too with this. That's so interesting because I used to work closely with Jeremy Epstein and Never Stop Marketing. And we basically, I think it was two plus years ago, he had this idea of a crypto Salesforce type CRM. And that was a huge part of it, that you'd go to conferences, everybody would have a unique token. That token would automatically give permission to put that person's information into the database, which was the CRM. And it's great to see that actually companies are doing that two plus years later. It's awesome. If you look at how many problems there are with ticketing and things like that, where people are scalping stuff, it, it, it sounds a lot like 2017 all over again, but that's just because it's the next level of that. It's okay. Now we've got this base layer with Ethereum and with these other blockchains where we were talking about that maybe being something in 2017. Now it's here. And like, I think the best marketing hook I've seen with NFTs was uh, Visa buying the NFT. I think it was three Bitcoin worth of um, Ethereum that they spent on it. And I think they got so much attention from that for buying this NFT that I would put that on the most interesting one I've seen so far. But, but yeah, it's a cool time. And I think it's just a matter of more and more adoption. But that's what you're seeing 
now. You see PayPal is taking crypto, like Venmo. Twitter has been doing NFT drops. That's another interesting one. It was a, I don't even know if many people even realize that they did this. Like one morning, they basically did a limited issue of NFTs and put them out there. So if you were on crypto Twitter, you probably saw it, but otherwise you probably didn't, where they were just giving away NFTs. And it's gonna be really interesting to see what marketers do with them over time, because it's a pretty versatile token type and there's things you can do with it. And we worked with this partner called Ether cards where they made it so you could have like programmable traits into NFTs. So they could program their NFTs so that it could include a bat bonus for every fifth NFT that you use or have these different things. So it's a multi-purpose uh, token. So I can go use this token to get into a concert and then every fifth concert ticket would have a backstage patch that would be loaded on it. So there's pretty cool things that you can program into these tokens that more and more developers and engineers are going to be putting out in the market soon. And I'm interested to see how agencies and, uh, and brands directly go forward with some of these things too, because some of the stuff's been pretty creative, but I think it'll even get more and more creative as we go forward. Yeah, you. it's a nice segue to my next question, which was how is Brave getting involved in the NFT market? Yeah, like I said earlier, we did some strategic partnerships with the gaming side of things, mainly because they're doing gaming's a neat grab bag on, on the crypto side because you have in-game tokens, which are fungible tokens that are in the game that people are using like credits. And then you've got land deeds and things like that with NFTs that are already in use. And then they also were using liquidity pooling uh, in DeFi. So you have DeFi NFTs and traditional tokens all working together. We played around with that for a while. We've also been looking into using it for access control, for being able to do subscriptions and access to content, paywalls, things like that. What I'm really looking forward to with this new wallet that we're introducing pretty soon on desktop and mobile, we'll have native NFT support and the ability to transfer NFTs from wallet to wallet. And so having that in the browser is super interesting because you could do things like create retention rewards for people that are, are, are staying with the browser version. So every time we have a browser version, we could mint an NFT for that version. And then if people are interested in collecting that kind of thing, they could collect it through. So you can have all these like community rating systems where people are getting achievement unlocks and they're actually tokens they can go sell on a secondary market if they want to. So it's just a gamification element of it. It's like super interesting for a browser because what we, we're dealing with the entire internet here. Other tech companies and, and products are pretty narrowly focused, but with Brave, it's, oh, everyone's online most of the time. And whether I'm focusing on one thing over here, I might see something over there or from the browser, like we've been looking at this, we have over a million content creators that have verified with Brave. And most of them are not aware, or maybe they're just learning about NFTs. We have an opportunity to one, tap into that creator base and, and show them ways that they can use NFTs to bring value to their you know business and then also uh, go after content creators that are making NFTs and, and have this really great platform through Brave Ads to add to discovery and let people know about their art or let these you know marketplaces advertise certain uh, drops that they're doing, et cetera. So you kind of have a neat option to access people at, at different times that other companies might not necessarily have th that advantage with. We're thinking about this on the art side, we're thinking about this also very much on like, how can we make a really tightly integrated experience with these tokens where you could use them to access a bunch of publishers or you could use them to access live events in real life, things like that. That's great. So why don't we switch gears for a minute and talk a little bit about you and the Brave Bat community. And we know it's a driving factor in making Brave a success. So can you talk about the community work that you're doing? Yeah, yeah, sure. And, and it was interesting. I fell into it when we were doing the token sale because these token projects, the community is such a big element of it because they helped to rally one in supporting the project and then two in helping to let people know about that project. And what you have is people were will buy these tokens and they are buying a vision and they're buying something they can use in the platform. And what we've done, Brave's open source, right? Like we have a really great developer community that contributes and engineers that contribute through GitHub. And that ethos goes through to our support and to just how we interface with the public. Like myself and Brennan, Donnie, you, other people are, are out there in like, whether it's LinkedIn or Twitter or Reddit or other social media channels, answering questions from people, like very engaged with the audience. And what we're doing, and this is what Brennan's really big about is, you know, 
you've got to really listen to those lead users that are using the product early. And what you want to do is build up a community of people that are really inspired by the mission and want to be a part of it. And they very much are a part of it. When we're doing on the privacy side tends to, especially early on, break a lot of the web. And you have people that are reporting sites that are broken. You have people that are helping create artwork to get this into schools, get this into local communities that you wouldn't typically access to. It's really kind of like a movement. You have to have a really strong community. And that community is, you know, they're gonna let you know when stuff isn't working and if they don't like something and you hear enough volume around that and you're like, okay, like it can help to drive things in a different direction. And when you're a startup like Brave is, it's really important, like right now especially, because at the same time that privacy is hitting the zeitgeist, you also have big tech has been really innovating on making like contactless things and, and making convenience really at the forefront. So even if you can prove something out on privacy, it's not about competing on privacy, it's about competing on convenience with privacy and doing that while you've got all these big tech companies that are also like trying to figure out how to get her into this privacy. You know, okay, Google's trying to take a stance on privacy and, and, and tell you how they care about privacy, et cetera. It, it's a very kind of strange climate right now, but having a community there, it, they rally things, they get things to friends and family, they give you friends and family's feedback. It's a really important thing here and like, my three quarters of my team at Brave and are were people that came in through the community and they were just volunteering to help with various things and ended up working here. So we take it like I'm a good example. Yeah, of it. yeah, Tony, yeah, you, you, Carlos, a bunch of these bunch of folks, right? Like it's just because when you're doing something that's new and impactful and is risky, but the fact of the matter is, it's a really hard problem to tackle. We're, we're doing something where incentives are all aligned in the opposite direction, and we're trying to say, hey, you don't need to do all of that. You can have privacy and you can have business and you can have user first kind of principles all working together. And ultimately, these are very close relationships that a user has with an, a brand, even down to McDonald's, right? Like users are trusting that McDonald's is going to not kill them when they put it in their body, whether that's a slow burn or a near burn, you know, is what it is, right? But there's this really high level of trust between people and brands and people and platforms. And we're trying to get everyone else out <laughs> and, and make it so that you can restore this first party kind of relationships uh, in a way that can scale. And it's exciting. But the community is like, we would be nothing with, without a community. I think if you look at the, the security team on Chrome, on Google Chrome is over 100 people. And our entire company is 100 and I don't know, a little over 100 people now. And we're doing browser, we have the token platform ads, all these other business lines that are emerging. That doesn't happen without a strong community. And without listening to that community, like that's the thing I really liked about coming to Brave. Because I came from the advertising side of things where it was very black box and don't report stuff unless it's really bad, things like that. And the thing I noticed coming to Brave was like, people were excited to hear that things were broken because they want to fix them. And you can, you can actually watch the whole process happen in front of you. And so whether it's with messaging or whether that's with you know marketing or with code in the browser, having that community around what you're doing is like so important. And it, because when it starts off, it's like, you know, we're doing stuff that's poking the bear in a lot of ways too. And so the company reacts when challenged and after a while, the community just starts to do that. And that's really cool to see because you're like, okay, like the message is resonating, it's sticking, people are actually defending uh, what we're doing. That's really awesome. And then the kind of proof is in the pudding everywhere else. So I don't know, if you build something strong and you have a really good community around it, it can really amplify that and accelerate growth and all of that. It's a mission and everybody touches the web and we want better privacy for everybody. That's right. So big picture. What do you think is the biggest threat or most pressing challenge that's facing the marketing and advertising industry today? I think that it's privacy is still big in there and, and antitrust, I think. But what is what is privacy going to look like? There's a really clear definition of what user data is and privacy. And in there it's about well, are they actually going to enforce the law? Here, you got big tech that's saying we're private, even if some of the things they're doing are very much the opposite of that. So what happens to privacy is important, whether that gets whitewashed, which is a real threat, or whether that we're able to be a standard bearer and help drive that in a better direction. I think the other thing that's always been top of mind has been regulatory conditions around crypto. And it's gotten a lot more friendly since 2017 days where everyone was just kind of sitting aside waiting to see, oh, the US regulators say this, and Singapore says that, and Hong Kong says this, da 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 
Now it's, so you've actually got banks transacting in crypto. It's a little bit less scary of a thing. But even now, like with this infrastructure pack bill that went in, there was a crypto clause in there. And these are written by people where that they're not that savvy into crypto because a smart contract doesn't know how to generate a 1099. Like it's still weird where the rubber meets the road on that side of things. And I think if you look at what's happening, even in like decentralized finance, there are people or certain projects are starting to do lobbying in Washington, D.C. So I, th I would say the politics of all of this are probably the biggest threat I see right now. I think there's enough of a powerful message and enough proof points around, hey, I can be my own bank. Look at what happened with GME, right? And with GameStop, like in AMC and all this stuff. So there's just a movement around empowering, pooling together as a you know new investment class, right? That's super exciting. Uh, I think those are the pop populist statements and proof points are there with crypto. I think that the regulators are still kind of, some are savvier than others, but I think between the politicians and the regulators, like how that fits is probably a risk, I would say. And then, you know, what banks do, but banks seem to be getting on board with the idea of stable coins. And you look at like El Salvador and other areas where the big experiments for how crypto can plug into uh, more traditional systems. That's great. And uh, how can people get in touch with you? Uh, I'm Luke Mulks at Twitter. And uh, yeah, th that's probably the easiest way to get a hold of me these days. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast, Luke. Yeah. Thanks for having me on, Donnie. Well, thanks for listening to our last episode of season two with Luke Mulks. And I thought that was a really great discussion about NFTs, which is a hot subject right now. And we talked about how NFTs are unique for every user and how both crypto brands and mainstream brands are using NFTs in their marketing strategies and the examples with Taco Bell and Visa with $150,000 CryptoPunks buy. There's just so many amazing examples of NFTs and we just scratched the surface. This is the tip of the iceberg as far as what is going to happen in the NFT space. And now is a great time to really learn about it. And hopefully you enjoyed this episode as a little bit of a primer if you're not 100% into NFTs. Again, this wraps up our final episode of the podcast for season two before we launch season three. And we've really had a blast. Some of the key episodes was we kicked off the season with Disney Plus and we talked about their huge growth. Then we had Chad Stoller from UM. And then we talked about B2B marketing strategies with Natalie Mendez. We had an insider's look at Brave Rich Rosenzweig. We talked to Bain Capital and Darren Herman over there about the investments that they're doing. Dylan Boyd from RGA talked about the work that they're doing there. And then our last most recent episode was with Procter & Gamble with P&G. So we've had some major, major brands, Disney, P&G, Bain. It's been a really, really solid season. So go back and listen to some of those episodes. We will be back in season three on October 18th. And we're going to have guests from challenger brands like Three Wishes Cereal, which I eat every single morning, eToro, which is one of the biggest exchanges out there, Crunchbase, if you're into um, investments or startups. And we love to get your feedback. So if you could take a minute to submit some feedback in the survey below in the show notes, we would love to make season three even better than season one and two. Even two minutes of your time clicking on the show notes, filling out a survey, we read every single survey, really helpful. Constructive criticism is great and compliments. We love those two. And on a final note, if you have a brand, a product or service that you'd like to get in front of Brave's 34 million users, please email us at adsales at brave.com and let us know your podcast listener to unlock one of two perks. If your budget is under $10,000 a month, we'll bump you up to the top of our self-serve waiting list. If your budget is over $10,000 a month, we'll qualify you for a 25% podcast listener discount. Again, that's adsales at brave.com. And lastly, musical credits for all of our podcasts goes to my big brother, Ariel Ginsburg. Devoren. He's recording some really, really great music out of Austin, Texas. So until our next season three, October 18th, enjoy your September, send the kids off to school, and we will see you soon. Thanks.